Hello, this is Roland. Welcome. Today I want to talk about health again. I've been talking about it the last couple of days actually. Made two videos. One was entitled uh, Refinding Wholeness. And the second one was Refinding Wholeness Part 2. So let's talk about that um, more. Um, I said that our body should be of a whole, that everything, all of our, in the Bible there's a passage that said, um, it was Paul, I believe, who, who said that we should make uh, every thought captive to Christ, every thought, okay, and so all of our thoughts, okay, if that were possible, now in the state that you are now, that's not possible, but you could begin now to attain a time when, when all your thoughts and your emotions and every gland, every organ, every system, every cell, okay, are all working together for the good of the whole. And the good of the whole, okay, um, is not a, not a selfish, self-aggrandizement good. Well, you know, it is the good of the whole is to serve God, to do God's will. We had an example, Christ did what the Father, he said, all I do is what the Father tells me to do. Okay? Well, that's the way our body is supposed to be. So that every word that you speak is, tr is, is truthful and not deceitful. Okay? And not sneaky and not calculating, but truth, truthful. And every emotion that you have is a is a, an emotion that serves good. In fact, most our emotions ought to be for our Creator. Gratitude, love, awe, wonder when we see the great creation that God has made. These ought to be for our Creator. Emotions uh, we ought not to be giving, having lots of emotions for other people. All of our excitements and our angers and our rages and our passions and our lusts, and you see, we use up a lot of, of our life force that way, a lot of our energy. And so what happens is if you, if you look at anger and lust and greed or excitement, you know, the excitement of, of having something or getting something, you see, there's, it's always tinged with, those are tinged with selfishness or pride. They serve, they serve something unholy in the place of the holy. We are, be, uh, we, we ought to be serving God. And in exchange for, for serving God, we receive his approval and, and his love. Okay? Now, you're a long way from that. A long way from that. Okay? Maybe you've gotten a little start if you've begun to meditate with my meditation, listen to my programs maybe on the radio and got started with the meditation. Or you may be quite uh, well along if you've been meditating for some time. Okay? But if you're not meditating with my meditation and you're just watching this for the first time or what have you, well then um, what I just said, it's hard for you to even comprehend. It, it, it could be. It's hard for you to comprehend not being selfish. Could, can you, for, for example, in your current state, can you imagine not lusting? Can you imagine not having that drink or that marijuana or that cappuccino, see, or that pizza, or watching that movie? Or Can you imagine not buying shopping and buying clothes 
so can you imagine not uh, not texting not having your marijuana cigarette or your pill or your cup of coffee see or your soda see you can't imagine now you have undoubtedly some of these bad habits of yours or excesses or indulgences see you see the selfishness but what I want to say right now before I go any further is that we're born selfish we're naturally selfish okay so you're not you're not being I'm not this is not condemning I'm not condemning because that's the way we're, we're we humans are born it's called being born in sin so we're naturally selfish but what happens is that we ought to be trans that as as we so we grow as little egos see we need teas and taunts and challenges when we're little kids just to even grow as egos okay it's all natural but then as we become young adults and then adults then we we have to begin to we're supposed to outgrow our selfishness see and that's one of the purposes of marriage getting married is so you can learn to be unselfish see before you get married you can be selfish and you don't even know it's selfish because you don't have anything to work for you see you have a job but you don't have a family you don't have children so marriage is is a way of learning to be unselfish okay but what I'm saying is that we're supposed to begin to outgrow our selfishness so that when you become um, 20, 25 or 30 or 35 or 40 you're outgrowing your selfishness see but it's hard for you to imagine and now now why now why is it why is it so hard see to, could you imagine giving up coffee or tea or your soda see you may not be able to imagine the, the possibility of that or your or your ball game see well um, um, it is possible See now you're thinking it. Oh, then that would be uh, that would be austere, and it would be uh, life wouldn't be any fun. See, you can't imagine a different set of values to live by. See, um, but they do exist, and it is possible. Okay, and you know yourself that after you in overindulge this and overindulge that, then you don't feel good about yourself. You feel uh, um, corrupted and a little bit you see uh, unclean and it's a little bit embarrassing and you or especially if you start gaining weight see or you start coughing because of your smoking or you know something like that then you 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 see that it's not good and you wish you could stop see and you've undoubtedly tried this is what I began to say earlier you've undoubtedly tried several times in your life to stop doing something or other to give up smoking or drinking or smoking marijuana or or or, or, or um, sweets or chocolate or um, movies or texting or you've tried to give up something, but you weren't very successful, undoubtedly. See, you probably weren't successful. You gave it up for a while, then you went back to it because it was a struggle. See, the problem is you've always struggled with it, which doesn't work because when you struggle with something, you're just you're just you're, you're just giving it more power or you gave up one thing and then substituted something else in its place okay but you you can see where selfishness leads can't you you see where it leads and you can sense where it leads see when you're young when you're 18 or 16 or 20 see well you can get away with being a little bit selfish you get away with it or get away with uh, eating too much or doing something too much but then as the years as time goes by pretty soon you don't get away with it. pretty soon it begins to show see um, and you see where it leads don't you you know, they, they say that marijuana the marijuana is a gateway drug I mean it's a it has to be alcohol is a gateway drug okay other pills pills certain pills uh, oxycontin or something could be a gateway drug see and I'm sure there's gateway foods that lead to see where does it lead every time you indulge 
every time you give in to the selfishness, see, you you give in to it. It it's call it's beckoning you. See, it's almost it's almost like it has a um, it's almost there's a spirit behind it, behind the chocolate, behind the potato chips, behind the marijuana, behind the cigarette, behind the images. See, it's ca calling you, beckoning you, wooing you. And then you begin to think about it, and you try to struggle with it. And when you struggle, see, you sense your weakness. And then before you know it, you give in to it. You give yourself up to it. You sac you're basically sacrificing yourself to it, to the God, the demon behind the spirit, the spirit of it. See, see how that is? See, there's an invisible reality behind, behind um, things. See, it's not just all, um, uh, you know, matter and uh, flesh and, and, bo and bones and rocks and trees and buildings. There's, there's also a spiritual dimension. There's good and there's evil. Okay? There's the spirit of heaven and the spirit of hell. And, e and uh, the presence of evil, see, it's not going to come with uh, horns. You're not going to see it with horns, okay, in the tail. What you're going to, what you're going to sense is, uh, you may even think it's you, your own thoughts. But it's something that comes over you. Almost like you, when you're falling asleep, it, 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 it encourages you to indulge and give yourself to it through the chocolate through this marijuana, through the alcohol, through the images, through whatever your indulgence is, okay? You, it's calling you, wooing you back. It's like, a, like an invisible friend that understands you. See? It understands your weakness. When you give in to it, how do you feel afterwards? You don't feel good. You don't feel good. See, you somehow have lost. You you've lost a little more of your character, a little more strength. You've given more ground. Now do you see? See. And that's why these things are gateway, gateway experiences or gateway drugs because. Because you see where they lead. It leads on the on the downhill slope they call that they call it the slippery slope well that's exactly it you look at a person when they're 18 or 20 and they they have their eyes are bright and they're full of life and zest and s sweetness and see and then you look at them when they're 50 or 60 you sometimes you can hardly even recognize them anymore see they've changed they've changed something see through their indulgences and surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, food, okay, I wrote a book, a very good book, it's called Forbidden Food, the, um, what's the name of my book? Forbidden Food, um, I can't remember the name of my book, Forbidden Food, The Legacy of Paradise Lost and the Promise of Redemption. See, food? Food has a mysterious um, a hold upon us, and it is through food. See, if, if you look at marijuana and alcohol and pills and the, all these things, there are subs food. There are substances, aren't they, that we eat or put in our mouth or breathe in? So they're extensions. They're just stronger versions or different versions or exotic versions of uh, more exciting, stimulating versions of basic food but food is see it was through food that your mother your mother expressed her will see your mother's will may was that you accept her will and accept her and worship her see and if she resented your father which a lot of women do because her husband is weak 
He may, he, maybe he's a, a bully or violent, but most of the time he's weak. See, her father wasn't there for her, and her husband's not there for her either. So she resents him, or he saddles her with responsibility. See, or he has character flaws, weakness, and vices, and so she resents him. So when you eat her food, you accept her will, and part of her will may be that you reject your father. See, that happens a lot. Did you reject your father? See, that's her will. So now you see if you, when you, so when you eat her food, you, you accept her will and her spirit or the spirit that's governing her. See, now you see how there can be conflict over food? See, food, it comforts you. It seems to love you. And yet it's not good for you. Sometimes if you eat too much of it, see, it's not good for you. It weakens your will. And then often the eating of food is accepting someone else's will. See? So now you see why that is. Now the other thing is that food was, was involved in the fall of the human race. The very beginning it was food, remember? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So it was the eating of forbidden food that resulted, that began the downhill slide in deterioration. Adam could have lived forever. Instead, he began to deteriorate, to change and deteriorate, and then and then um, and then die eventually. It it happened that the the forbidden experience was the eating of food. It could have been something else. Instead of an apple, it could have been a donut or a marijuana or could have been a, a uh, pizza <laughs> maybe or corn on the cob whatever it was we don't even know what it was really it was just it was a tree of uh, it was a tr some kind of forbidden food well how about now how about forbidden food now so if you eat something in anger if you eat something in resentment if you eat something to ac accept another's will have you noticed how when somebody gives you something even even if they give you a little flower, then all of a sudden you see how that flower, you see how it can obligate you. Be careful though, don't resent them. Don't resent it, because if you resent them, see, then that resentment is also a fall. And then you are guilty for the resentment, and then you can do their will out of, to appease the, the guilt for the resentment, you see. So you see how these, so, okay, so we talked about food. So now you see what happens when you do it. So let me just tie the two ideas t together, okay, before I end this video. I, at first, the first I talked about that our, our whole being, mind, emotions, body, down to the, to the cell, should all be serving um, a good purpose. And in this case, the good purpose would be God's will. Okay. Serving God's will. And then there would so there would be no rebellion and there would be no working at cross purposes. So and and so and the 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 mind, the body, the emotions would 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 look inward for instruction, for wisdom, for guidance, for love. Okay? But what's happened is that other people have impinged upon you with pressure. They've emotionalized you. They've upset you. See, and they tempt. What they were doing was was tempting you to react, to respond to them. So now your body has been trained and conditioned to respond to other wills. See, other intelligences, other agendas. And so now parts of your body respond to all kinds of things. See how that how that is. So the part of uh, of the meditation process of the me of beginning to med of meditating is to become recentered and to learn how to look within. Um, some of the mystics like uh, um, uh, uh, F uh, F François Fénelon from France uh, or Miguel Molinos. They talked about recollection, recollecting, and what they mean is to draw within. Is to draw within. See, and so we begin to look within, 
find God within, find love within, find intuition within, wisdom within. Okay? So you're in the world but not of the world. So you still go about your business. You you work and you have recreation and you're a mom or a dad or a brother and friend. You're, you're, you do all these things. Okay? But you're just not so deeply involved in them anymore. Okay? Because you always have with you the like a, a delicate strain of music, the the always checking with your intuition, checking within with your conscience, looking first to intuition, see, and then if there's no nothing withholding you, no impediment, nothing holding you back, then you go ahead and take the next step, and the next step, and the next step, see, but you never completely forget, forget who your creator is. It says in the Bible, remember uh, your creator in the days of your youth. Okay. Now a lot of us try to re remind ourselves and we, we make affirmations and so on, but the meditation really gives you the state of mind where you're no longer immersed in thoughts and immersed in emotions, but you're standing back a little bit and you go out in the world with a uh, a slightly distant feeling. Okay, it was kind of like what you had when you were a little child. Remember when you were a little child, you were very self-contained. You played, and uh, you enjoyed your, you loved your mommy and your daddy, and you loved your pet, your pet, and your cat, and your dog, and your friends, and you loved uh, discovering and playing and doing things. Okay, but you were uh, sort of had your own little self-contained uh, self. Okay. You weren't totally fragmented out into the world, okay? Which a lot of people, more and more, are because of their. It's because of a, of a lack of understanding. And no one's taught you, as as I, for example, am now, you know, making you aware of such things. No one get, had a meditation for you to help you to become centered again. And no one talked about these things in such a way that you could see the importance of remaining composed and not be becoming upset and not becoming resentful and uh, and always doing what you know is right in your heart and not uh, giving in to the peer group pressure and things like that see well all right so 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 now you see that um, so now you see that and then you also see how um, food or other things can be the entry w way for another will that operates through people. See, another will, another kingdom. See, it says in the Bible that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. Okay, so there's an invisible dimension. You can't, t you can't see evil. You can't taste it. You can't touch it. You can't smell it, but it exists. See, and you sometimes sense it as a, as something as a, a pressure in your mind, okay? Well, the meditation helps to close the door on, on, on that. See, as you, as you begin to um, become centered, and as you begin to, um, to have some self-control, and as you are mindful, see, that's part of it to be mindful. Now that there's a term, you know, people talk about mindfulness meditation as a very good term and the idea is a good one, okay? But then the question is, mindful of what? <laughs> okay, mindful of what? It's not good enough just to be mindful of the present. I mean, being mindful of the present is better than being lost in thinking about the past or worrying about the future. It is better, okay? But, but also mindful of God, mindful of your Creator. See, that mind... That mindfulness, that just the delicate knowing that he's there, it humbles the soul. See, it um, it chastens, it subdues, it, um, and it and okay, it also it's like having a good it's like having a good father. See. If you have, have a good father, you can always go to father. If somebody's press, the kids are pressuring you, you know, hey, let's get in the car and let's go do this and this. 
and you say, well, let me check with my dad. Dad, can I, can I get in the car and can we go out until 3 in the morning? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I can't. My, da my dad says I can't. I have to come home. See, it's good to have that kind of a, of a good father, see, to help you resist the uh, pressures. Well, if you meditate properly, then you're closer to God. And then you become aware ever so gently, ever so delicately, he, he will, um, he will um, make you aware of his presence. Okay? And that's a very, com it's very comforting. It's a very, very wonderful and comforting thing for the soul to know that God is there. Okay. Well, I'm going to make an end to this video. I hope you enjoyed it. My name is Roland.